So um, Craig is going to teach us about citizen science. I hope y'all read that section in your manual, in your uh, curriculum. And um, I think those are all the announcements I have, Craig. If I think there's something else, I'll, I'll tell them at the break. But um, Craig does a fabulous nature walk from the Cibola. Am I saying it right? Cibolo, yep, Cibolo Nature Center. Cibolo Nature Center. If you've ever had a chance to watch him on Facebook, it's wonderful. So, Craig, take it away. It's all uh, yours. All right, very good. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I hear that you're at a nature center this morning. I wish I was there. I was, I've worked at a lot of nature centers in my life. And and uh, I would concur that if you are at a nature center, you should make sure you get out and uh, visit that thing before you leave this morning. Anyway, um, so this morning, I'm going to uh, try to cover both community science and then within the scope of community science, I'm going to be talking about iNaturalist. Um, hopefully, uh, you all are aware of iNaturalist and hopefully all of you use it. If you, if you haven't started using it, I would strongly encourage you to do that because it's a great way to contribute through community or citizen science. So um, we'll go ahead and just jump right in here if I can get my, there we go. So I am part of what's known as the Community Stewardship and Engagement Program now. It's not a team anymore. Apparently we're upgraded to a program. And uh, what we do is we reach out to um, um, communities uh, across the state of Texas, whether it's Master Naturalists, whether it's uh, Native Plant Societies, whoever it is, we're an equal opportunity uh, recruiter of community scientists or citizen scientists. I'll use those terms interchangeably this morning. Um, and what we try to do is get folks engaged through the use of the, the iNaturalist app to try to help contribute information about our state's flora and fauna through making observations. We're part of the wildlife diversity program within Texas Parks and Wildlife. And there are going to be two of us again uh, Wendy Anderson, who is also currently working in a different position with Texas Parks and Wildlife, will be joining the team a week from uh, this next Monday, actually. So I'm um, very excited to uh, have uh, Tanya's uh, position filled. And Tanya is doing, if, if you, if uh, I don't know if any of you, some of you may have run across Tanya Homayoun, but she's now our state ornithologist. So she's got a great job that she's uh, diving into right now. So the Texas Nature Trackers program, again, tries to reach out to the larger community uh, throughout the state of Texas um, and use iNaturalist as a tool to funnel observations of the state's flora and fauna through our program so that we can vet that information and then pass it on to the research and conservation community with the hopes that eventually it gets into something called the Texas um, Natural Diversity Database. We do have our own web page uh, within Texas Parks and Wildlife called Texas Nature Trackers. Uh, we have different projects that we monitor. We have target species that we are looking specifically looking for uh, in those iNaturalist observations. And then, of course, we have a, a link where you can go and see what other things you can get involved with, including uh, the upcoming City Nature Challenge, which I'll, I'll mention at the end of the presentation this morning. We do have 12 projects. We, our projects range from everything from the Herps of Texas, which is all the reptiles and amphibians, all the way down to monitoring Texas eagle nests. And where y'all are over there in East Texas, both of those groups would be very important to document. Uh, we're working right now with, with uh, trying to actually get more information on the eagle nests that are active right now around Texas. Um, they stopped doing aerial surveys of those nests some time ago, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So this project uh, functions as a very important tool for monitoring how eagles, bald eagles are doing uh, across the state of Texas. Uh, and then of course we have Texas Whooper Watch, which is a project that's been going on for a very long time. Uh, and then birds and mammals, and you can see there's quite a, a, an assembly of, of projects that we, that we oversee and or monitor. Again, we try to take those inf the information that comes into those projects um, looking specifically for what are called species of greatest conservation need. And then that information, once it's vetted, 
through our uh, curator, project curators. It can end up in the Texas, Texas Natural Diversity Database, which basically is this big database that tracks all of those rare either plant communities or uh, species of plants, individual species of plants, and of course, individual species of animals. So it's a very important task that we have here and we invite everyone to become participants. So first of all, what is an SGCN or a species of greatest conservation need? Basically, it's a native plant or animal that is, is declining or rare and in need of attention to recover it or to prevent the need to list under state or federal regulation. Our goal um, is to, uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife's goal is not to add to the list. Our, our goal is actually to get them off the list. Um, so we want to um, know, but in order to do that, we need to know about them and as much information as we can. The bottom line is our biologists are out there doing their job and doing their work. Our taxa biologists are out there. Um, every county has at least one a biologist assigned to it. Uh, many of them only have one biologist and, and thus they cannot track every species that's out there on the landscape. And that's where community scientists or citizen scientists come in handy because you all can be the eyes and the ears of um, the conservation, the state of our, our flora and fauna across the state if you engage with that. So who are our SGCN? Um, it's everything from the whooping crane to uh, the ocelot you see over there, we've got lots of different kinds of plants. The American bumblebee is one that's concerned, the Houston toad, uh, the, of course, the Texas horned lizard, uh, the loggerhead shrike down in the lower left-hand corner, the butcher bird is one, even the, even the northern bobwhite is a SGCN. So uh, right now, there are uh, right, right around uh, 1,300 species that are on this list. Uh, this list, just so you know, is not just some magical made up thing. Uh, our taxa biologist, including Tanya now as a state ornithologist, reviews these on an annual basis to determine how, how are things going. And if they're going well, and, uh, well enough that the animals can be removed from that list, great, we do that. Uh, otherwise, uh, if there are animals or plants that need to be added, of course, those decisions are made as well. So that's kind of just a very quick overview of what we're doing and who we're after to try to get to um, understand um, what we're uh, what we're trying to do. So let's talk community science or citizen science. In 2014, the term citizen science was added to the Oxford, Oxford English Dictionary. Uh, and it's defined as scientific work undertaken by members of the general public, often in collaboration with or under the direction of professional scientists and scientific institutions. In your Texas Master Naturalist book, it's defined as citizen science refers to the engagement of amateur naturalists in scientific investigations. Um, and so I'm a citizen scientist and I, I'm also a professional biologist, but I'm out there contributing things as well, even on my own time, simply because I think it's really, really important beyond the scope of the work that I do as a profession. And of course, historically, there have been amateur scientists or naturalists um, out there for forever. And uh, they've been making contributions to understanding our plants and animal uh, animals um, throughout that long history. Uh, here in Texas, a lot of what we know about plants was because of three folks, Ferdinand Lindheimer, George Engelman, and uh, Jean-Louis Berlandier. Um, all three of these were, I would call them amateur scientists. They were not in that profession. They were not in the profession, if you will, but they had a strong interest in plants and plant identification. And back then they were out there collecting plants, sending them off to the the great botanists of the day and they were naming them and all of that stuff. So you will see, especially if you open up a field guide of plants um, in the state of Texas, you're gonna see these folks' names attached to a lot of those plants because they were the first people, uh, you, first Europeans to see those plants and then give them names that we use today. Um, there are also other ones over time, John James Audubon, uh, was a, uh, a person that, of course, we all know about the bird efforts that he made. Uh, William Herschel was a famous astronomer. Uh, Mary Annings was a dinosaur, early dinosaur hunter in Europe, in England. 
Um, pretty fascinating uh, outfit that she's wearing there. I, I would have never looked at that and said, oh yeah, she's a dinosaur hunter, uh, simply because of the, the, the dress and the bonnet. But uh, you, will, you will see she has her archeology span hammer right there in her hand, ready to start looking for fossils. So um, citizen science come, scientists come in all different stripes. I mean, there are kids that are citizen scientists, they're elderly people, everybody. Um, is can be a citizen science, and a lot of uh, a lot of folks are, even included folks like these two, uh, these women, um, that, that uh, Strom and Sorby spent a year, a win winter's year in the in uh, the, the uh, Antarctic, collecting data on various citizen science projects. Imagine that; that seems to be extreme, but they uh, apparently did it for a long time. And then Giannis Mexica, uh, Me Mexia. Um, was actually a, became a botanist and uh, her, her uh, discovered, I think, that somewhere around 500 different species of plants that are named after her uh, or, um, or several hundred are named after her and she discovered 500 different kinds of plants. Um, and she was a mother and t had an interest in plants and, and uh, became a very well-known uh, botanist around the world. Um, so when you talk about citizen science, there are different levels of engagement. So the main, uh, the main type of engagement is what people refer to as contributory. And basically what that means is that um, what people are doing is they're going out and collecting and submitting data uh, under the gentle, if you will, supervision of a sponsoring organization such as National Audubon or Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology. We're gonna visit some of their projects this morning. Um, what basically what it's doing is saying, hey, you're a bird watcher, for example. Well, here's an app you can use to submit, to keep records of the birds that you're watching through eBird is what I'm talking about. And we'll talk about that later. Um, and as a result of that, when you're tallying up all your birds, that information is actually going then to the agency that created the app. And as a result of that, they're taking able to take that data and learn a lot more about the birds that are being reported. So it's it's really easy to do. And we really, a lot of times we don't even realize we're doing it. Um, and that's again, why it's just, it's uh, we have an interest, we are out there doing it and people are actually now able to use that information to learn more about uh, our flora and fauna. And uh, again, it's just, it's very, it's sometimes even almost passive in terms of what you have to do. Others are much more involved um, in terms of what we do, and that's collaborative uh, engagement in, in regarding citizen science. Uh, participants are more deeply involved. They may be assisting with data analysis. I have a group of master naturalists actually that do virtual curation. They're on our projects, reviewing our, our observations and verifying them. Uh, it's a great a way to get engaged. Um, there are uh, some citizen scientists are also helping with project design and creating protocols and the actual citizen science uh, contribution by themselves. Um, and they're doing it as a research project or um, uh, some sort of contribution that relies on the scientific method. So it's not just random, randomly collecting information. They're trying to be actual scientists. And in the best cases, citizen science blurs the distinction between scientists and non-professional participants, while at the same time maintaining rigorous scientific approaches to understanding processes and solving problems that neither group can solve on its own. And this comes from a book called Citizen Science, Public Participation in Environmental Environment Research. So it's really important that the general community is out there um, helping us uh, by contributing that information. Without that, we just know a lot less about what um, is going on. And one of the things I always like to say is that if you, um, when we make decisions in our life, we want to have as much information as we can to make the right and the best decision. When it comes to natural resource management, oftentimes we're making decisions on some information, but not a complete picture. And while we'll probably never get a complete picture of any species out, that's out there, the more information we can have, the better our decision making can be. And, and that, that's why citizen scientists are so important when it comes to natural resource uh, management and understanding. So there are benefits of community or citizen science. First of all, it gets people outdoors to explore their surroundings 
hopefully to ignite their scientific curiosity about their home place, creating what I what what's been referred to as a sense of place. Um, and I and I and I think that's really really important. I remember when I was in, a kid in Iowa growing up in a farm community, they would talk about in science class about the rainforest and and these places far distant places which were really interesting. But there was never an effort to actually teach us. Um, about our home place, about what, was, what were the trees and the animals and the things that lived in our own community. And I think that's something that um, we need to have more of. And this allows us to do that, to become more familiar with our home landscapes, whether it's our backyard or the back 40 or the local park. Um, and I've always been, a, a as, as a naturalist at heart, I want to know what's out there. I want to know how they interact, how these different things interact with each other. Um, because the, the bottom line is if we don't care or if we're not taught it and we're not encouraged to explore it, then the conservation of it doesn't mean as much to us. It's, it's like things blink out or fade out or disappear and nobody, a lot of people don't notice it because we're not really engaged or connected to the land. And that's something we really all need to be able to do, especially in this day and age when land is going away from us, those natural areas are going away from us at a very alarming rate uh, throughout Texas for sure. Um, community science also increases the public's ability to cr think critically and improve scientific skills and understanding of the scientific method, at least I hope it does. It can address the erosion of trust in science currently plaguing society today, and that is a major issue that we have here uh, when we stop believing in science. Um, and uh, all of that that has come about with science, we really are in trouble. And if, if you don't believe in science, then I would suggest you give up your cell phone and your car and your heat in your house and all of those things. Those are all generated because of science. So uh, we need to rethink how we think about science and the contributions through science. It can bring together diverse groups to take action on serious environmental issues that impact all of us, regardless of ideology or politics. And it provides data collection that simply is not possible with the current number of scientists that are out there. I wish everybody wanted to be a scientist. Wouldn't that be a, it'd make a, it'd be a different world if that were the case. So let's talk community science projects out that are out there. I'm going to start with birds. Birds are one of those critters that are ubiquitous. They're everywhere. Um, I always, when I was doing environmental education, um, I always told people, I said, if you go out on a, uh, on any given day, and other than invertebrates, insects, spiders, things like that, the most commonly encountered critter you're going to find other than other humans is going, are going to be birds. They're going to be singing. They're going to be flying by. You might see a feather on the ground, those kinds of things. Birds are all around us all the time. Uh, especially during our daylight hours. Now, if you were a nocturnal creature, that might be a little bit different, but because we're mostly diurnal creatures, birds become very relevant in our lives on a daily basis. So there are a lot of citizen science projects that you can become engaged in. One of the, the most popular ones is uh, the, the uh, uh, National Audubon's Christmas Bird Count, which takes place uh, between de de December 14th and January 5th. Uh, each year. It's been going on, uh, well, over 100 years now. And basically what it is, is groups of people get together. Um, people have different experiences in terms of bird identification. Some are fairly new to it. Some are very experienced. They team up, they work together in a count circle. They create a count circle and they go out and they count birds on a given day. And all of that information then is contributed for better understanding. And it kind of got its start um, because of Frank Chapman, a famous ornithologist a long, long time ago, they used to go out to Hawk Mountain in Pennsylvania uh, in the fall when the hawks were migrating over these mountains. And instead of looking at the birds and counting them and enjoying them through binoculars and with cameras uh, like we do today, the goal was to go out there and shoot as many of them as you could. Um, and, and so it was finally suggested that maybe instead of shooting them all, we actually started counting them all. And that was an early sign that conservation of our natural resources was just beginning to take place. And again, you can't, I'm not blaming anybody 123 years ago. I wasn't there. It was a different day and age. Uh, but it was great that people had the vision of saying, hey, let's, let's appreciate 
the natural resources um, um, uh, as well as utilize them when we need to. Um, so it's a great project. Um, it, this data is used. It was used in Audubon's 20, 2014 climate change report. Um, it's also been used in other uh, projects to try to assess what's going on with our birds during the winter months. And the reason these long-term projects are, are important is we can go out, when I was in graduate school, for example, I did two years of research on Eastern bluebirds and red-winged blackbirds and how they responded to um, an emergence of periodical cicadas up in Northwest Arkansas. But that was just a two-year picture. Um, that's not a lot of I'm not going to make any global decisions based on two years worth of data, but if you get 100 years or 50 years of data and you can start to see trends in population growth and, and contraction, things like that, that becomes much more powerful in, in terms of making conservation decisions. Um, that's the same way it is with everything else in our lives, and we're just applying it to the natural world as well. Another project that is engaging uh, community scientists is the Cornell uh, Labs Project Feeder Watch. I've participated in this on and off throughout the years. Basically, you sit at your home, you put out the bird feeders and throw out some seed, and you start counting the birds. And it's been going on for quite a long time. It started in Canada. Um, Cornell rolled it out in 97, 98, and annually more than 20,000 people uh, participate. And it goes on from November to April, and you count twice a week or two days in a row every four days or five days, whatever it is, contribute what you can. And um, it's a great way to just learn about what's around you, that information is helped. It helps again, just like the Christmas bird count. This is another way to look at bird distribution, bird population trends, um, eruption events where birds all of a sudden come out of nowhere. Um, when their food supply uh, uh, fails in a given year, the birds may move south in massive numbers. Um, it also uh, has been used to contribute to scientific research and papers, including a book called Birds at Your Feeder. It's a great little uh, book to learn about that information. Then there's the Great Backyard Bird Count, another um, project. Again, I told you there are a lot of projects on birds uh, from the Cornell Lab and also National Audubon uh, and then also Birds Canada. Uh, but this is a, a, a four-day event um, that happens in February where people just count the birds in their backyard and contribute that information. Uh, it's all done just like the uh, now the uh, the uh, back uh, feeder watch, you can do everything on an app on your phone. So you don't have paper copies that you have to worry about filling out and mailing or uploading all that stuff. Everything's done right on the computer. Uh, and in fact, this is the first online community science project um, in its entirety. And then of course we have the Cornell Labs eBird. This is the app that everybody is using for bird watching now when they keep go out and they, and I do it every time I go for a walk, I'm, I'm, I turn on my eBird and I start punching in the birds that I see and how many um, I see of them, of each one. It's, uh, it's, uh, it, it's collecting more data now than any other app or citizen science project on earth, literally. They're gathering somewhere in the neighborhood of 100 million bird sightings per year. So that is a reflection that there are a lot of bird watchers. Um, this is an app that when I first heard about it, I thought I'm never gonna use that. I'll keep using my, my little pad and my pencil and I'll keep making notes there and or I'll write it down in my bird book. Turns out um, I was thinking like a Luddite, uh, this, this, is, this is the way to go. And um, I, I now uh, use it all the time. And again, it's contributing tons of data. Uh, so that, and it's a great way to actually track bird movement across the landscape, uh, timing of that bird movement, and then just numbers. So we can start to understand how our birds are doing. So just to kind of give you just a quick example, of what they do. I'm going to try to play this. Hopefully it'll play on, on your screen. This is a bird called the yellow warbler. If you watch these little dots here, that's all based on bird identifications made through eBird. And you can see how that bird moves through the landscape on a given year. They now have through BirdCast, um, an, or, a, a, a website called BirdCast. You type that in to a search, you'll find it that actually tracks migration on a daily basis um, using radar 
and it's fascinating stuff. Um, and I would encourage you to investigate that, especially if you have an interest in birds. But again, again, let me just show you. Here's where the bird is in the winter time. You can see the calendar moving. They start their migration up through North America. You can see the dark purple is where they do most of their breeding. And then, of course, there's their movement back to the south. And the more we understand that, especially as, as with with um, um, the, the the changing environment that we're, we're we're dealing with now, we get a better understanding of how these birds are are uh, moving across the landscape. And the reason that's important, by the way, just one reason: these guys eat insects. And one of the concerns is that as temperatures change, will that impact when flowers start to bloom in the spring? And then will that impact when the pollinators, the insects that these birds eat, um, hit the flowers? And is the timing of that gonna become skewed? Um, and if it does, that could have a dramatic impact on birds like the yellow warbler. So the more we can contribute data, the better we can start to understand, or people way above my, my uh, uh, smarts can start to understand what's actually happening, there, happening out there. Because one of the things to keep in mind, if it's affecting them, ultimately it's going to impact us. We can't, we can't ignore that, that reality. All right, another bird program. Uh, I swear we're gonna get away from birds pretty soon if you're not a birder, uh, but why aren't you a birder? Everybody in that room should be a birder at some point in their life. It's a wonderful disease to have and it doesn't make you sick, okay? It's just a great way to connect to the natural world. Um, anyway, so Nest Watch. Um, Nest Watch is a, is a program that a lot of volunteers uh, participate in. If you put up a nest box, you can actually contribute data through NestWatch, you can do it all right there on an app. You can do it on the web page as well. Plus, it just gives you the web page gives you tons of great information about the different birds that use nest box uh, nest boxes or don't use nest boxes, but you can record data for. So it's an awesome, awesome way to become involved and again understand better about our birds. And then, if you're really into birding. Um, there is the USGS Patuxent um, Center's uh, North American Breeding Bird Survey. This is way more engaged and way more involved, but this is started it back. This started back in 1966, and it's tracking bird breeding bird population trends over time. Uh, it began because of what happened back in the day with DDT and how it killed millions of uh, untold millions of birds. Um, and, but, and it's still ongoing because again, as the environment changes, we need to know what's going on with those birds and other wildlife so that we can adapt to it and hopefully uh, not watch those things uh, disappear. But it's a 24.5 mile route that's been designated all across the country. There are lots of routes in Texas. I do a couple of them uh, here in Texas myself, each spring, my wife and I. Um, and what you do is you stop every half mile, you get out of your car, uh, you count birds for three minutes, you write it all down, and then you drive another half mile, pull off, do the same thing. You do that for 50 stops. And um, it goes on from mid-May through late June in Texas. Uh, but again, it's very intense. You need to know your birds really, really well. Uh, but it's something that's kind of fun to do, I think. Um, I think I'm in my 12th or 13th year of doing that, I think, something like that. Um, and you can, and this is really, a, of all of the projects, this probably gives us the best picture of what's happening with breeding birds in North America. Now let's talk monarchs because everybody talks monarchs and monarchs have been coming in back into Texas. They're still down in Mexico. I did just see a report on the uh, overwintering population. It, de it decreased from the previous year. Uh, hopes were that that would, number would continue to rise. And, and this year, unfortunately, it went down again. Um, but Hope springs eternal when it comes to monarch populations. So we'll see what happens. The Western monarch population went down to just a few thousand individuals two years ago, and then all of a sudden recovered to the highest number they'd had in, in, in a long, long time. Uh, so these are uh, animals that are pretty, uh, uh, they've been pretty good about surviving for long periods of time. But there are different projects you can get engage with monarchs. Uh, if you're interested, one of them is uh, monarch tagging. This is done, uh, it was started by Fred and Nora Urquhart, Urquhart 
Um, I always I always bitter their, their names. I apologize to them. Uh, but they they were out of Canada, scientists out of Canada, and they were trying to figure out where do monarch butterflies go. They knew that monarch butterflies flew out of Canada in the fall. Uh, people in the United States knew that they were flying by, uh, and then they just disappear and nobody knew where they went, except for the people in Mexico that um, where they came every winter, and when they were celebrating Day of the Dead. Um, and, uh, but the, it was a different world back then. Communications weren't like they are today. It wasn't until, um, I think it was 1966 or 76, that 66, that it was finally discovered where these, where these butterflies went um, down into Mexico. But they started putting these tags and there's an example of the tag on the wing of a monarch and let it go. And in the hopes that they would actually, people would actually find them. And then when they turned in that information, they could start to draw maps of the migration patterns of these, of these butterflies. And eventually it was discovered. The tagging continues today. It's done through Monarch Watch, which is out of the University of Kansas. You can buy tags, 25 tags for, I don't even remember, $15 or something like that. Um, uh, and you can you can go out and catch your own monarchs in the fall, not during the spring and summer, but in the fall. And then that if if your tag is found down in Mexico, uh, they will there's a website you can go to and check on that and see what's going on. Um, and now it's done as much for as an educational tool as it is for science, even though they're still doing it because as the population has dec declined generally as they have been for the last 25 years. Um, the more we know about where the monarchs are traveling to specifically throughout the country and into Mexico, uh, the more we can hopefully practice some good conservation on these guys. The other thing to tell you is that anybody can do it. Even the guy on the right can pull it off. Um, and, uh, and my good friend over here, Laird, uh, had, was always afraid of, as a, he was, something happened to him when he was little, he didn't like touching any animal. Now he's a monarch. He's a big monarch tagger. He's a master naturalist, uh, here in the, uh, hill country area. And, uh, we go out and have had some good, good times, uh, catching and tagging monarch butterflies. And just to kind of show you what the data that can be generated from that. Here was a monarch that traveled 558 miles in basically, what is that, ninth? Tagged on the ninth and on the 12th, it was recovered in Georgia. Um, it can travel a long ways. They usually average about 20 to 25 miles a day, depending on the wind. Uh, but this one made some big time mileage. Um, and remember, this is a critter that is basically weighs the, 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 the same as a paper clip. So um, very tiny critter and makes these incredible migrations. The longest, ta the longest traveled record was one that was tagged way up here um, and was recovered in Mexico. Uh, so that was um, uh, just that that's I think that was over uh, 2000 uh, between two and 3000 miles at that that butterfly tag. The one thing I do have to say is when they find the tags down here, that usually means that they're dead. Um, so it's a recovery. And, and uh, I down here in Texas where I live and I'm still looking for the return of a tagged monarch. That's my goal in life. One of my goals in life is to find a spring return that's still wearing a tag. Uh, the day that happens will be an awesome day. Uh, for community science. So, so if you if you're out chasing monarchs or watching monarchs or photographing them in the spring, watch for those little round tags on a wing. You too could become famous. Um, maybe I don't know if you'd really become famous or not, but uh, it'd be pretty cool. Um, and it does show you can actually again go and uh, when you contribute that data, uh, some of your tags actually do get found. I've had a few found uh, when I was up in the Omaha working in a nature center up there. Um, this one was um, uh, recovered up in the Omaha, or tagged in the Omaha area back in 97. It traveled 1,500 miles to El Rosario. And then when I was working in a nature center in Blue Springs, Missouri, outside of Kansas City, that one traveled 1,384 miles. So pretty, pretty uh, neat to be able to see uh, your contribution actually paying off, if it were, as it were. There's also through the uh, University of Kansas uh, program, Monarch Watch, there's a monarch way station program where you can set up a way station for monarch butterflies by planting milkweeds, providing water, providing nectar plants. Um, as of uh, the 20th of August last year, there were over 40,000 monarch way stations. You do have to pay for that metal sign. 
because it's a way for them to you to contribute uh, supporting uh, to, to support that program. And then there's also Monarch Joint Venture, which is out of the University of Minnesota. And it is a big partnership. It has agencies all over the country um, that uh, partner together. That's a great place to get information about monarch butterflies. In fact, one of the best places in terms of if you want information. Uh, if you just heard a bunch of footprints running around, my our dog is apparently getting to go for a walk and is pretty excited. Yes, I know, I know. Hang on, it's okay. <laughs> okay, you know, scratch me, scratch me to death. Sorry about. That. Um, so they have a project that community scientists all over the country get involved with called Monarch Larval Monitoring Project. This photograph is of some master naturalists from the Guadalupe chapter that started a, a project a few years ago at a wildlife management area. Basically, you go out and you find a patch of milkweeds. It could be in your backyard. It could be in your back 40. It could be on a local park someplace around there. Um, yeah, no worries. And um, uh, what they do is they go out and as, when the milkweeds emerge in the spring, they start following it every week. They go out and they check the milkweed leaves for eggs. You can see a picture of an egg there. You can see how small that picture of, the, of that egg is. Uh, and then they also are looking for caterpillars and they track that information, put it into a database to see how monarchs are doing. Uh, it is uh, wearing knee pads is probably a good thing because you're on your hands and knees a lot looking at those leaves. But I've participated in this for a long time. I love uh, it's a it's a fun project to uh, become engaged with. And so, why monitor monarchs? I guess that's one of the questions that people might ask. I took this off of a PowerPoint presentation that an old friend of mine was a part of. Uh, but basically, the scientific reasons are that the monarch's large spatial and temporal range makes volunteer contributions necessary to answer population questions. They're not isolated critters. Uh, the, there is a variety of there are a variety of research approaches, and a, monarchs again are a, in, a, a ecosystem indicator, the health of an ecosystem. If they're doing well, chances are the landscape is doing well. If they're suffering, then we know things are happening. And right now, we know things are happening. We know that there's less land for them. We know that some of the uh, chemicals that are used in our crops now. Um, uh, allow for the widespread spraying of, of uh, chemicals on the landscape that knock out our the, the milkweeds, the very plants in the agricultural parts of the country that these monarchs require in order to uh, survive. Um, so those are all things that are really, really important. Um, and and uh, another thing that's just a real practical thing from my standpoint as an educator and a biologist is that it can engage the general public and, and, and the monarch is a ubiquitous species. I, I, I remember a few years ago when I was working for state parks that there were people going, can't we pick a different butterfly because I'm so tired of the monarch butterfly. Well, here's the problem with that. I'm mean, seriously, people would say that. And, and the problem with that is that everybody knows what a monarch butterfly is, or most people do. And so why would you go and pick some, you know, random other little butterfly that nobody's ever heard of if you're trying to engage people in learning about and appreciating and participating in uh, conservation of our natural resources? So that's something to keep in mind. And the monarch is one of those just iconic species that um, kind of like the bald eagle. If we all of a sudden said, you know, we're tired about the bald eagle. Let's go get the sharp shinned hawk and let's let's deal with that. Who knows? Most people don't know what the heck a sharp shinned hawk is, but everybody knows what a bald eagle is. So sometimes you got to pick those iconic species and stick with them because a you can learn a lot, you can engage people a lot, and so trying to uh, have that kind of denial about things like that is uh, is nothing short of ridiculous, if you ask me. But that's just my opinion. Um, uh, but it's a real opinion. So and here's the Monarch Larval Monitoring Project, just to give you an idea of where all of these projects are. This map is a little bit old, but there are more of these now here in uh, Texas. So, and I think um, Texas is either first or second in the number of these um, Monarch Larval Monitoring Project locations. I think Michigan leads the pack, if you will. <laughs> or used to lead the pack. Another project that some people, a more limited number of people get involved with is this um, project Monarch Health. This is out of the University of Georgia. And this is where you uh, capture monarchs and you um, test them for something called Ophriocystis electroshira. And if you want to just call it OE, but it's a persistent uh, protozoan parasite that has a negative impact on 
uh, monarch butterflies, when they're migrating their health, they either can't fly very well, they're deformed. Um, and one of the challenges with monarch conservation in Texas, uh, we have lots of different species of, mon of milkweeds, over 60 species of milkweed in Texas that are native to the state. Um, we also have one that is not native to the state, but is probably the most popularly purchased one in stores, in garden centers and places like that called tropical milkweed. The problem with um, tropical milkweed is it doesn't die back uh, readily. All of our native milkweeds do. These parasites are, are these uh, parasites are spread by the butterflies themselves as they go from plant to plant. Um, but the, the, the advantage of the plants that are native to Texas is that they die back. And I'm, when, it, when a monarch, when a milkweed uh, senesis goes back to underground, all it just, dis, it just flat out disappears. And so um, the butterflies don't have a, a plant that they can continually visit over and over and over again over a long, long period of time. Because the more butterflies that visit, they, the possibility is they might pick up more parasites and that just helps spread the disease. Well. Tropical milkweed, which everybody plants in their, a lot of people plant in their yard or garden, um, is great. Monarchs love it, right? But it doesn't die back. So if the disease is on those plants, as more monarchs come and, and use those plants, they build up that parasite load on those plants. And thus, it makes more parasites to get on more monarchs. And it can actually have a negative impact to monarch health. So they're testing for that to see how widespread this is. If you use um, tropical milkweed, the suggestion is that make sure you cut it down before the monarchs start migrating through your part of Texas each fall, cut it to the ground. So that minimizes that, um, uh, that danger, if you will, because sometimes here we are trying to help the monarch and we're actually sometimes actually doing it more harm, uh, unintentionally, of course. And then there's also through um, uh, National Wildlife Federation, they have a monarch stewards program. This is for uh, butter monarchs, but also for all pollinators. I'm a trainer for this particular program through National Wildlife Federation. So that's something to investigate. Their next workshop that they're having is in June. Uh, you can reach out uh, or go to the National uh, Wildlife Federation's webpage and ask about their, or look for their monarch stewards program. And you can sign up for the next workshop that's gonna be held. Uh, I think it'll be online here in Texas. And there's also getting away from just monarchs. There's also the North American Butterfly Association's 4th of July Butterfly Count. That's a mouthful, isn't it? Uh, it was formed in um, 1992. Um, the National Butterfly Center down in Mission, Texas is the sponsoring agency. Um, it has the largest known database of butterfly populations in North America. And it also promotes butterfly conservation on local, regional, and national levels. And these are folks from a couple of different chapters, the Alamo chapter, the Lindheimer chapter, I think the Hill Country chapter. We do uh, uh, monarch, uh, or I mean, butterfly surveys at Guadalupe River State Park. We've been doing them now for over 10 years. Uh, and we do it twice a month um, so that we can monitor the butterfly population, see how they're doing on the landscape in that local area. A lot of places are now starting, um, uh, butterfly, local butterfly surveys that they do annually here in Texas is a little easy because even on Christmas day, you can find butterflies most years. Um, but it, but this is one of those, um, citizen science projects that allows us to get a picture of those butterflies over time. Um, whether it's the monthly surveys or whether it's this um, 4th of July count so that we can see what trends are happening. Again, butterflies are very sensitive to the environment. If they're declining or, or if they're doing well, we want to know that. Uh, it can be very, very important as a reflection of the overall health of the environment. And then there's this web page, which is way more than just insects and monarch butterflies. It's called Journey North. And it is awesome. It's now, uh, it was started by Elizabeth Howard in 1994. As a citizen, this is one of the first citizen, true citizen science projects. Um, there are more than 50,000 contributions a year. Um, and it's now run out of the University of Wisconsin, Madison. Uh, but they track monarchs and they track all mm -hmm. kinds of other things. Hummingbirds, tulips, tu tulip gardens, pollinator patches, uh, sunlight and sun, uh, sunset all kinds of things. The cool thing about the monarchs, 
This is their map. This is going on right now. I printed this off just this week. So if you watch over here, here's the, the timeline. They start tracking monarch movements uh, back north in January, February. And those dots indicate where people are reporting monarchs in real time. So again, let me play that one more time for you. See how they start getting reported. And they will track that migration all the way through the United States as they move back out of, out of uh, Mexico all the way into July. So it's, a, it's an ongoing live sort of feed that you can contribute sightings to monarchs. And again, it, you know, it's very simple to do. It's not hard to do. Um, and um, I, I do it when I can, for sure. And then finally, uh, there's this uh, National Phenology Network. This is something that started back in 2007. It's becoming more and more popular where you can actually create your own uh, phenology project. Phenology refers to the ebbs and flow of the natural world. So when do these flowers start to bloom? When do these butterflies show up? You know, when do birds start migrating? All of that's kind of, it's just tracking what's going on outside your window. And uh, I'm involved, have been involved with a project that's monitoring uh, cedar fever, uh, the release of ash juniper pollen in the hill country to, because this, there are scientists trying to make models that will predict when those, when those, um, when the pollen starts flying so that people that are affected by that can take steps in advance to, uh, to uh, hopefully protect themselves from the worst effects of, of, that, of that allergy. So that's that. Okay, what are we, how are we doing for time? It's 849, all right. So now we're gonna talk iNaturalist because that's what I do um, in terms of my job. And uh, I'm gonna give you an overview of why iNaturalist is important. We're gonna talk about the app both on the iPhone and the Android. I'm gonna share with you the web page because the web page has got all kinds of cool stuff on it. Um, and then uh, hopefully we'll have a, a little time for questions. Um, I see it's 8.50, so I'm gonna keep cruising, okay? So take another drink of coffee, here we go. Um, so iNaturalist was actually created by some college students in California now, uh, back in the day. Uh, and it's an online social network of people sharing biodiversity information to help each other learn about nature. That's a lot of words to say that it's a way to take, go out and take pictures of the natural world. The two primary goals of iNaturalist, the agency, the, the organization that set it up, was to connect people to nature and then also in the process, generate scientifically valuable biodiversity data from those personal encounters with the natural world. If you remember back in the day when phones all of a sudden had a camera and all of a sudden there was Facebook and, and people started going, hey, look, here's what I'm eating for dinner tonight. And they'd take a picture of it and post it or the new shoes they bought or whatever. Um, and, and these folks had the brilliant idea of saying, you know, we share all that stuff. Why not share even more meaningful things, the nature around us? And it's been a, a, a wonderful project since that time. So how it works in generally uh, this looks more confusing than it actually is. But first of all, you have to create an account in iNaturalist. Um, very simple to do. You give an email, set up a username and a password, and boom, you're done. Um, uh, then when you go out and use it, you, uh, you're gonna make, you got to have some evidence of what you saw or heard. You can do a, record a photo or a sound using the iNaturalist app on your phone. What you saw and when you saw it, the when you saw it is easy because that the date and the time is already stamped on there automatically from your phone. So for those of you that think, oh, well, I can't do this or I can't do that because they're tracking me, this is, uh, we're being tracked um, in so many different ways, but certainly iNaturalist is, is doing it through a, through a timestamp. And then what you saw, so that would be, you are making a decision of, well, I took this picture of this thing. I don't know exactly what it is, but I'm gonna guess that it's a plant because it's a plant or it's a butterfly. I may not know what butterfly it is, but I can say, hey, this is a butterfly. Um, and then what's really cool is the artificial intelligence of iNaturalist is actually analyzing that picture and helping you identify it by making suggestions of what you're looking at. Um, so it's pretty cool and we'll show you how that works. And then where you saw it is real important, especially for agencies like TPWD, because if you take a picture of something that's rare or unusual, if you don't put a location on it, then it does us no good in terms of understanding the distribution of that organism. So why iNaturalist? 
Um, first of all, it emphasizes community engagement. And that's really, really, really important. Um, everybody says they care about the environment, but very few people actually do anything to care about the environment. We live our lives. We're not really engaged. Things happen and things go away and we go, oh, that's just too bad. But I care about the environment. Um, this is a way to get people caring about it in a real and meaningful way. It's an open science platform, which means anybody can access the data. Um, it focuses on peer-to-peer -peer collaboration. And again, that community or citizen science component. Um, it reveals how local areas fit into larger pictures. The more we know about a local area, we can take steps to protect the things that we can there. And then that contributes to what's going on outside of that local area. And just uh, I, I watched a, uh, a webinar the other day by the uh, co-director uh, or co-executive director of this, uh, this uh, effort, iNaturalist. And they said in between 20 and 2020 and 2023, the percent of observations compared to all other ways that this kind of data is collected by scientists and others uh, came from that came from iNaturalist, 63% of mammal observations globally came from iNaturalist, 81% of reptiles, 73% of amphibians, only 10% of birds, largely because eBirds out there and making the bigger contributions there, 64% of other chordates, fishes, things like that. And then more than 60% of plants and insects both. Um, and that's significant. That's a lot of data. And I'm gonna show you a couple of maps in a bit that shows you just how much uh, data is being generated through iNaturalist. So when you make an observation on iNaturalist, what you're doing is can, you're creating a digital voucher for the presence of that organism, okay? So you take a picture of this thing, it puts a little dot on the map and says, this organism was here at this date and time. Excuse me, just a minute. So that's what all these dots are on this map. These are different organisms that people have documented and that's the digital voucher. So in, instead of in the old day, if you wanted to know where things were, you'd go out and you'd pull the plant out of the ground, you'd smash it in a plant press and you would make a record of it that way. Or you'd shoot the animal and you'd stuff it and you'd put it in a collection that way. Those were the, or you'd pin an insect. Those things are still done. However, this is the way to get that information and not be quite so invasive on the actual organism. So why use it? Who's using it? Uh, book, authors are, book authors are using uh, iNaturalist data. Heather Holm is one in particular that has a book on the wasps of, I've got my book over there, the wasps of uh, North America or the bees of North America, things like that. They're actually using that data. And they're not just because there's great pictures on iNaturalist, Heather Holm, for example, when she talked about each species of wasp, one of the things she was doing was putting together a list of the plants that wasps um, feed on. Wasps are predatory from the standpoint that they sting, sting to paralyze their prey, bury that prey, lay an egg on it, and that's what their larvae feed on. But wasps, when they're out and about as adults, are actually eating pollen and nectar. So they're not predatory in that sense. Now, none of us, they're, we might think they're predatory when they sting you, um, but they're actually not predators in the sense that they're actually, that's for their babies. But for, as adults, they're actually feeding on flowers. And, and she was able to generate those lists based on, here's a picture of this wasp, what, the, what is the flower that it's, it's uh, actually feeding on? And she was able to create those lists, which are really, really uh, very beneficial actually, for those of us that follow pollinators and things. Um, there are more than 3000 peer reviewed papers, scientific papers using iNaturalist observations that continues to grow. State and local agencies like TPWD have used them and are continuing to use iNaturalist data. Just to give you a few examples, here is um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife uh, using iNaturalist to get people out to uh, contribute information. Here's the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. They've got a great public facing uh, web page where you can go and look at the distribution of wildlife in the state. And again, they're using the iNaturalist app to encourage people to contribute data. Colorado Parks and Wildlife, same thing. 
Uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, same thing. They're using iNaturalist. University of Florida, the extension uh, 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 um, agency in, in Florida is using iNaturalist to contribute data. And of course, um, meanwhile in Texas, here we are, we're using it. This is from only a few days ago, over 7 million observations from iNaturalist just in Texas of 26,000 plus species. And, and, and that's significant. That's a lot of data that we would just simply not have if it weren't for community or citizen scientists. Now, the, the, the only thing that's alarming in this slide is that we've only got so far 138,000 observers. The bottom line is I believe there are a lot more people in the state of Texas than 138 people, thousand people. So we've got a long ways to grow the number of observers and the number of identifiers. And that's where master naturalists like yourself can add to the number of observers making those observations and contributions so that we can practice even better conservation than what we're doing right now. Globally, there are over 128 million observations. So this is a powerful, powerful data collection tool. Just to show you what the effect is here in Texas, there is no general, there is no, you know, there's no herp, you know, e-herp for documenting snakes and, and frogs and, and lizards across the state of Texas. So the Herps of Texas project that we began several years ago has contributed over 5,000 records of tracked herp species. And that information has actually helped us remove several of those species from the SGCN list, knowing through, again, through community science efforts, figuring out that, hey, this species is doing better than what we thought. Um, and, and that's powerful information because then we can start to focus on other species that are actually doing even worse and we need to be able to step in and do something for them. So um, when we look at it, let me uh, do something. I don't know if, let's see, I want to, no, I don't know how to get rid of that thing. Anyway, so if we take a look at um, uh, the community science, again, here's research goals can be enhanced and achieved through crowdsourced data collection. Here's an example. So the Eastern Spotted Skunk is a small carnivore that is very secretive um, until it sprays, of course. But um, so they were trying to figure out what's going on with the Eastern Spotted Skunks in Texas. So some researchers from a university, they put out camera traps, which are game cameras, track plates where the animals walk across and they leave their tracks behind and live traps in 10 different counties trying to figure out where are Eastern spotted skunks in Texas and that part of Texas. They had 8,000 device nights and over that whole time, they had only 12 detections, 12, 12 detections in only four of the 10 counties. That's a really low detection rate. That's hard to make any kind of conclusive inf uh, 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 decisions about what, how they're doing or what's happening with them. So at the same time though, they were smart and they put out a, a uh, wanted poster, it literally, about the Eastern Spotted Skunk. And they asked the general public, hey, if you've ever seen this thing, please contribute to it, this your a photograph to the iNaturalist project. They got more sightings than they did in all of those device nights. They actually had 21 county records instead of four county records. And that is because of folks like yourself. Uh, so that, again, a very powerful way to collect more information than we can. Uh, through traditional methods. Um, I was watching a uh, presentation to the uh, uh, TPWD commission last fall, and all of a sudden our small game biologist came on and said, hey, we're looking to see where we can expand squirrel hunting opportunities in the state of Texas. And they actually used iNaturalist records of squirrel um, uh, identifications to see if, that, uh, if their populations had expanded. And based on that, they could look at that as part of their decision-making process. So even for this kind of, of, of uh, uh, activity, they can use iNaturalist. And of course, we all remember the storm from a couple of years ago. We had lots of uh, people reporting uh, dead animals of every kind. We stood up an iNaturalist project and in a very short order, we got over 3000 observations to document what happened to our flora and fauna in the state, mostly uh, fauna. Uh, the, the, the critters across the state. 
And then of course, in terms of just using the data generally, um, by people out visiting parks and taking pictures with iNaturalist, um, it helps local land managers, whether it's cities or counties, make decisions about those, those public spaces. Um, and uh, in some cases, they find out that these public spaces are being used a lot more than they ever thought they were. Um, it also can help make decisions about how they're gonna manage those properties. So here's iNaturalist. We've got nine, we've got 30 minutes, let's kick it. So you gotta create an account. Hopefully everybody's created an account. You can create an account from your phone. Uh, uh, very easy to do. I uh, you download the app. You can go to the web page and do the exact same thing. Uh, and and uh, again, not hard to do on either uh, in either regard. So when you log in here, you can uh, there's your create account. There's your login if you're using the web page. Um, so the app, let's review the app. So when you open up the app on your iPhone, which is on the left, the Android is on the right. This is what your screen on your phone is going to look like or something very similar to it, depending on the version of phone you have. And when you want to take an observation on the iPhone, you're going to click on the camera or on the uh, Android, you're going to click on this green circle with a plus sign. And on both phones, you have multiple choices here. You have no photo. Well, here, let's use the, the circles that I, I fancily put into the presentation. You can use your camera. You can use the camera roll, those pictures that are already on your phone. You can now record sound on both styles of phone, or you can record an observation even if you don't have a photo. So let's just uh, first go through this by clicking on camera roll. So we're gonna go into all of our pictures and we're gonna select a picture we wanna to add to iNaturalist. So we click on that, you get the little uh, check mark there, you click on add, and there it is. Heller's beard tongue, um, which by the way is blooming right now in this part of Texas. Beautiful wildflower, I've got some right outside my window. Um, and um, then you process the information right here. We'll show you how to do that when we get to the actual photo thing. So there's the things, date, time, location, geo privacy, we'll talk about what that is. Captive or cultivated, we'll talk about that and then what projects are. So now let's say you wanna record sound. You hear a bird singing, or you hear something down in the creek making a weird sounds and you wanna record it. So you just click on record sound, then you click on that microphone to start recording. I would recommend that you go at least 15 seconds because there's nothing more frustrating than hear something sing and you start to record and then it just sits there and nothing happens and you're going, okay, when's the bird gonna sing again? Come on, come on, come on. <laughs> you know, it could be really frustrating. So make sure you record long enough to get at least, I would say at least two versions of that song if possible. Um, so that way other people listening to it to help you identify it have enough information to be able to figure that out. So when you're done with that, then you hit save recording. And then after that, here's what your symbol on your screen is going to look like. It's going to show this speaker and that's your sound recording right there. Notice there's no photograph. The other thing is when you, what did you see and you click on that, nothing's going to happen because the um, phone app is not set up to identify the sounds. It's set up to identify photographs, but not sounds. So what you have to do is type something in there. So if I click on that and I look up, it's gonna to go to look up a species by name. I'm gonna type something in there as a placeholder. So I don't know what that bird is, but I can type in bird and then select AVs or birds on their, on their drop down choices. If I know what it is, and in this particular example I did, and I typed in cardinal. And then later somebody can come in and go, yep, that was a cardinal and they'll confirm it for me. But put something in there just as a placeholder. So that, because if you don't, sometimes it will get ignored by other folks using iNaturalist that are trying to do identifications. So put something there to the best of your ability. When you look at your page after you do a sound, it's gonna look like this. It's not gonna be the picture of the animal or plant, well, plants aren't singing. Well, they probably are, but we just can't hear it. Um, so I know that's weird, isn't it? Yeah, right, okay. Um, but it's gonna give you a symbol. So that's what it's gonna look like a little bit different than the, the normal observation. So now let's use our camera. So when we click on the camera, first of all, I'm gonna tell you, there's two things here to keep in mind. You have your cell phone camera camera, then you have the camera that iNaturalist is gonna use. In the iPhone, you cannot edit your photograph 
using I, the iNaturalist camera. So, or using the camera through iNaturalist. So if you need to edit a picture, if you're gonna take a picture of a small insect and you need to blow it up because it's just so small in the picture, then take it with your regular camera, edit that through your regular camera, then upload through your, your list of photographs, right? But if you are using an Android, you actually can edit the picture in the iNaturalist camera when you take a picture through it. So a little bit different between those two cameras. So we take a picture of something on each phone. You'll notice here's the image that we took. If you want to add another photograph, you can click on either one of these squares with the plus signs and add a second photograph of the same thing. Uh, don't add something else because then that's two different observations. Then once you've done, you've got all the photographs you want, then you're going to click on what did you see? And when, here's what's really cool. This is where it gets mind blowing. Then it's actually going to tell you, give you some suggestions based on the photograph, again, using the artificial intelligence. And I just learned that they have about 70,000 species that they have, are using iNatural or artificial intelligence, training the artificial intelligence to identify those plants. And they need about 100 observations of every species in order to be able to do that and make it better and better. So the more pictures we put out, even of common things, the better the artificial intelligence get, gets in terms of making identifications. So it's gonna give you choices. The first choice is always gonna be something more generic. So this is like, well, we think it's an oak when we think it's an oak. Um, and then it's gonna give you suggestions that are actual species for the most part, not always, but for the most part. Get to insects, the game changes quite a lot, especially beetles and bees and things like that. Um, so you, if you know what the species is, you can select that and then it's gonna populate it here. Now, if you don't know what it is, it's okay to just choose the generic choice, that's okay you're still putting some kind of placeholder on it. The next thing you'll notice that there's date and timestamp is right here and over here. Then you can actually click on this. This is your location information. If you click on that, it's gonna open up a map that you can pinpoint the actual location even finer if you want to. You can either do it as a satellite map or you can do it as a, a standard map like that. You just use a finger and thumb, press it in or press it out, whatever it takes to do that. And then you hit save. Then geo privacy. This is really an important aspect, one of the most important aspects actually of iNaturalist. So what happens is when you take a picture and you put it on iNaturalist, everybody not only sees the image, they also see the actual location of that item that you took a picture of. But some people don't want to share the actual location with the general public. Part of that is because there are poachers of, of box turtles and, uh, and other turtles and other crit critters and if they were to use iNaturalist in that manner, they could track down the location of those species and steal them and go sell them, which is, of course, illegal. So um, you, if you leave it open, everybody sees the coordinates and the location on a map. If you hit obscured, instead of the, there'll still be a map, but there'll be this big 22 by 22 kilometer area with a random dot. So it doesn't show the exact location. But if you want to protect it all together, you just hit private and nothing shows up on the map. You can see it, but nobody else can see the actual location. And that's really, really important, especially for rare species. Uh, and then if you're a private landowner and you've got, you know, um, Texas horned lizards and you want to share that information with TPWD, but you don't want the public to see where those locations are, you can do that. So that gives you a chance. And then you have captive versus cultivated. If it's a wild thing, then you just leave this. It's then it's a wild thing. If it is captive or it is cultivated, and mostly it's cultivated, then you should put cultivated. Okay, so we don't get the a misconception that oh that plant grows native right here in my yard in Bernie. Well, it's a native plant, but I planted it, so that's a cultivated plant. So keep that in mind. And then you want to look at projects. If you click on projects, these are all projects that you've either joined or are a part of. And there are two different styles of projects. There are these traditional projects where you physically have to, like ours, like our TNT projects, you physically have to join them. And then when you make this observation, you go to the proper place and you hit the little toggles here on the right of the screen. And that will actually add it to that project. These projects down here are called collection projects. You don't have to do anything other than make your observation. So for example, 
when City Nature Challenge is going on, uh, anybody taking a picture on iNaturalist in, in the state of Texas during that four year period, their observation is gonna go into that project regardless of whether they join that project or not, if they are in that, that physical boundary for that project. Once you're done, you share, hit share on the iPhone, you hit click the check mark on the uh, Android and you are good to go. Now, this is a picture obviously of three vultures, black vultures. And I don't know what the original first choice was on this photograph. So just so you know, it could have been black vultures. Hopefully it was black vultures. But I just want to show you that sometimes the uh, iNaturalist is not perfect, okay? Not 100%. The bear definitely agree, disagrees that that is a bear. Um, so, so don't be surprised. Don't be surprised if that sometimes happens. Um, I one time had, when I first workshop I ever helped teach, uh, three and a half years ago, whenever it was, a lady took a picture of a, of a, a mushroom, a fungus on a, a rotting log, and it came back as first choice river otter. So <laughs> iNaturalist is not 100%. It will never be 100%, but I'm telling you, it does a great job. It is literally like carrying an animal encycl or plant and animal encyclopedia around in your, in your phone. So if you want to learn about the natural world around you, use iNaturalist. If you don't want to use iNaturalist, at least download the, app, uh, the, I, the uh, other iNaturalist app called Seek. Write this down, S-E-E-K. You do not have to create an account. It was designed for children, but we find that uh, it's actually had more downloads, more than 10 million downloads than iNaturalist has because it's so easy to use. You just point your, your phone at the thing and it comes up with an identification and you're done. But it doesn't, the only thing is that doesn't contribute to this uh, community science. It's a great identifier for you, but it has limited uh, um, application to the greater good for conservation across Texas. So keep that in mind, but do check out Seek. It's really, really pretty cool too. So let's talk photography tips, because you know what? Um, it's hard to take really good pictures of everything in nature using a phone. It just is the reality. One of the things I use a lot of times when I'm taking pictures of very small things is I use this thing called Zenvo. It's a 15 power mac uh, macro lens you attach to your phone and it serves as a big old macro. These are close-ups using this macro. Each of these little flowers on this um, uh, spice, uh, spice bush tree uh, each one of those was about two and a half uh, millimeters tall. So you can see the detail you get with that kind of thing. Um, there are apps that do mag, um, uh, macro, add, make a, your phone a macro. Uh, they work okay. I'm still experimenting with one right now. But they work okay. Uh, but this is another great tool. It costs about 40, 40 to $45. It's glass. It's very well made. I use them in our program trainings. If I were in person with you today, we'd be uh, experimenting with that. Uh, but when you're going to go photograph wildflowers, get the best picture you can of the flower, of course. If it's not big enough, if you can't get close enough, edit the photograph so you can really see the detail. Take a picture of the, of the flower head, if you will, or the inflorescence that has more than one flower. That can be beneficial. The other thing, by having my hand in here, um, it gives me a sense of scale uh, of how large that flower is or and different part, plant parts. Take a picture of the leaves and take a picture of the entire plant. Even though the uh, artificial intelligence is only gonna look at one of those pictures to make its determination, uh, if, it's not, if you're not having luck, you can switch the picture that it's using. And then that way, maybe you'll get a better, uh, more refined identification based on those different pictures. When you're photographing trees, woody plants, I always like to make sure I include a picture that includes the arrangement of the leaves on the stem, whether they're alternate here or they're opposite, like you see here on this big tooth maple. That can be really valuable for identifying uh, woody plants. I sometimes will take the undersurf a picture of the undersurface of the leaf because the veins are easier to see. Sometimes they're very hairy or fuzzy, pubescent. That can be an identification um, uh, clue. Uh, if I find fruit on the plant, I'm going to take a picture of those fruit, include that. And if I find thorns or prickles or tendrils on a vine, for example, I'm going to take photographs of that. The more information I have about that observation, the more I'm going to learn about how to identify that plant. 
And then hopefully iNaturalist helps with the actual identification. When it comes to invertebrates, dragonflies and damselflies, by the way, neither one of these were taken with a phone. They were taken with a, a, a macro lens on a camera, which means I was extremely close to these guys. I was standing, literally standing within two feet of them with my camera. But the reason I show you these, your pictures may not turn out this spectacularly. I, at least I'm being very, uh, I think they're pretty spectacular and I took them, so uh, <laughs> be that as they may. Um, the, the, key, the reason I've included dragonflies and damselflies, a lot of times they're very territorial. They all have a place, places where they like to perch and return to that same perch over and over. And if you see one you wanna to try to get a picture of with your phone, watch its behavior. If it's landing on the same place and then flying off and then landing, get as close as you can to that place when the dragonfly or damselfly isn't there and then stand real quietly and wait for it to return. And if it does, then you can snap your picture and it works pretty well. With butterflies, of course, a lot of times the wings on the top and the wings on the bottom are different. So try to get as uh, top and bottom if you can. Sometimes you can't, that's okay. But those differences actually aid in identification. With other invertebrates, with spiders, I usually photograph the backside or the dorsal surface of the spider. Um, of course, they use the eyes, the arrangements of the eyes a lot of the times, but spiders usually don't let you get that close to take a picture of their eyeballs. Um, so do the best you can there. And then with other insects like this bumblebee, um, getting a photograph of the side of the, the insect shows more of the, the color differences and characteristics. If you do the top, sometimes you can't see the side and that can be real important to, to aid in identification. So just a few tips on invertebrates. When it comes to birds, most of the time you're not gonna do that great with birds in an in a iPhone or an Android phone. Uh, but if you do happen to get a picture, this picture right here, iNaturalist would probably try to identify the tree. So what I did is edit the photograph. It's not perfectly clear. It's not something I'm going to hang on the wall, but it's now close enough that it identified that as a Says Phoebe. With other birds, if you get silhouetted birds, sometimes it'll identify it for you. And then other times you take pictures of birds like this and there's multiple species in here. What I'll do is I'll take this back to my, I'll take this and edit this picture so I can have two observations, one of a snow goose, one of a Ross's goose, uh, instead of confusing iNaturalist and going, well, I don't know which one we want you to identify. And then of course, if you have find a bird's nest, you can take a picture of that, preferably with the eggs. If you just take a random bird nest, you might not get an identification, but with the eggs, you have a chance. By the way, these are lark sparrow eggs. This is the nest of a blue grosbeak in a cedar tree. And then remember, again, we talked about recording sounds, sounds work, and it actually does a great job with sounds in terms of recording. Uh, there's also an app out there for birds, by the way, called Merlin. If you haven't got that on your phone and you go out, if you're going to do environmental education with kids or you're just out there trying to learn birds, download Merlin and it will actually populate the sounds as you're recording, tell you what they are, and you get a record of those sounds as well. It's really cool. They don't have something like that for frogs and toads, unfortunately, but sounds do count. By the way, that bird on the left was a, a bird called a burden. Uh, and don't forget that animal tracks count and roadkill counts. They're actually mm -hmm. roadkill projects to document uh, what's going out there on the roadsides. And that actually helps lead to decisions to put those big green crossovers or to put culverts under for animal crossings to reduce uh, roadkill uh, impacts. So what iNaturalist does and doesn't do, it is it measures species richness. It does not measure population numbers or health. It does not measure absence. You can't take a picture of something that's not there and say, here it is, it's not there. Um, the, the phone app is a data collection tool. The website is where you really can have an impact. And I know we're getting close, so I'm going to, uh, by the way, the goal of all the observations that we use for our data is that they need to be research grade. And what that means is that two thirds of the people that have identified, that have confirmed your photograph or sound agree. And once it becomes two thirds, it becomes research grade and that becomes a trusted observation in terms of the identification. So I'm gonna go through this very quickly. This is the web page where you can, line it, you can log in. Here's what your web page looks like. Um, and everybody has their own web page on iNaturalist. 
You have this top bar up here. These are the more of the larger community things. The smaller bar down here are your individual tabs that you can explore your data. So very quickly, if you hit explore, this gives you all of the observations globally. You can also go in and type Texas and get the observations for Texas. You can even go to Montgomery County, Texas. I think that's about where some of you might live. I hope I got that close. Um, and you can look up the um, red cockaded woodpecker and get all the identifications for that in that particular county. So that's what you can do when you're doing that, um, just looking at observations generally. Your observations can be accessed either through this tab or this tab right here. We won't go through that too much. You can also go to community and you can look for people. You can get involved in the forum where you can ask questions and other people will help you answer those. You can look for projects. You can start your own projects. We won't have time for that today. Um, you can search for projects here of, of topics that you're interested in. You can help with identifying. If you have expertise in specific areas, you can help with identifications. When you do review one for somebody else to help it get to research grade, it'll show you that you reviewed that particular one. Under community, you can go for the help. And here's the one I wanted to show you. This is the best help web page I've ever seen. It's got tutorials on it, video tutorials, all kinds of questions can be answered by you going to the help um, part of iNaturalist. You can also do searches for taxa, any kind of critter that's out there for images if you need to borrow images. You can even look at for places, different places uh, around the world. And I know I'm hitting this really quickly because we're about out of time. And then if you're ever on the web page and you need to get back to your main web page after you're exploring, go over to this symbol right here, click on dashboard and it'll take you right back to this. You have a profile page where you can check it out. You can do that. Uh, the one thing I will tell you is when you click on that and then go to account, you need to make sure your time zone is central standard time. The default is Hawaii time, which is not helpful <laughs> uh, for us in Texas. And, uh, and that matters when you're doing bio blitzes, by the way. And then of course your observations are here, your IDs that you've helped ID are here and projects are right here. And so there's your observations. You can have it as a grid. I mean, as a map, a grid, a list. And again, I apologize for going so fast. There are different kinds of projects. We have each year, Texas uh, Parks and Wildlife hosts a pollinator bio blitz that the general public can become engaged in. A bio blitz is going out with a group of people and going and recording everything you can in a period of time and getting a snapshot of what's going on in the natural world on that particular, uh, within that time frame, And that's what a bio blitz is, they're fun to participate in. You can have site-based collection projects like they do at, at uh, WG uh, Jones State Forest. You can have taxa specific projects. There's butterflies of the state forest. They have their project. We have one at Guadalupe River State Park that's been going on for a long time. You can have prop, you can start a project in your own yard to document what you have going on there. I'm now, as of yesterday, I'm up to 519 species in my little less than quarter acre yard that I've uh, restored with native plants. Uh, pretty cool. And then of course there is the City Nature Challenge coming up from April 28th through May 1st. You guys, I believe, are in the Houston area, uh, and it's a great chance to get out and use iNaturalist and document. Houston is always one of the top five uh, metropolitan areas globally. There are over 250 uh, global communities that participate. Houston always represents Texas extremely well, along with Dallas. There, that's way faster than I wanted to do it. However, mm -hmm. I, I, I've lived within the time limit of 90 minutes. So with uh, four, th three minutes per question, I apologize, we only have three minutes for questions. But I, I have a question for you because I think that you helped write the, um, the Texas Master Naturalist Guide to, um, to recording your hours for, um, for citizen science. Oh, I was hoping you wouldn't bring that up, but yes, no, I, I, no, it's so sad, tough. sadly I did. <laughs> no, it's so it's it's hard. So most of, from what I understand, let me see if I understand this correctly. From what I understand, if you are out there looking at and recording for iNaturalist, it has to go into a project, correct? 
Yeah, it should be project based. Your observation is correct. Okay. And so it's not the actual time you spend out there taking the pictures, it's the recording it in iNaturalist. And it's. Well, yeah, and that's kind of tricky because let's say you're using your phone and you're out doing recordings um, of, of an area for a project. Um, it's going in there. You're not doing it on your uh, computer back at home. Um, so if, and boy, and this, the general rules are, and I haven't reviewed that for a while. So I apologize if I don't get this exactly accurate. First of all, each chapter has some flexibility in what they determine as what they can do. But generally, let's say if you're doing, if you're participating, for example, in City Nature Challenge, when you're out taking pictures on City Nature Challenge of those things, that time can be included as, as volunteer hours. But let's say it's uh, today and you go back to your house and you start taking pictures of plants in your yard, that doesn't count, okay, as, as, uh, as volunteer hours. Because remember, the idea behind Master Naturalist is that you're making a, con a contribution to the community for conservation, right? So doing that kind of self-identification just because you want to learn what's out there, that's on your own. But if you're contributing to one of our projects or another project, let's say Hartwood starts a, I know some of the chapters when they have their new class, they start a project at a local nature area and they use that as a way to train their staff up on I naturalist and they can count that time towards contribution because they're contributing to a specific project at a specific location. So that's something to think about. So if you're if you're doing most of your training at that nature center, you know, start a project um, and I can help set that up if anybody needs help with that sort of thing. But you could use that as a way to get people engaged in using iNaturalist, contributing data, and then also um, getting hours for that those observations. So that's that's part of the answer. If I go into much more detail, I'll screw it up. So I, I'm going to be a little careful. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, we do have on our website um, that um, sheet that discusses. Yes. Exactly. Yes, we do have on our website. Yep. So it, I will let everyone know where to find that. Yeah, mm. it's, it's, it's a challenging issue. It's really a challenging issue, so. Any other questions for Craig? Yes, there, Andy. There's uh, of course the email that you sent us last week. There's a bio mix on April the 13th. On April 13th. Oh yes. Uh, oh, I was I was gonna bring that up. Okay, so Craig is here virtually. Craig is going to be here on April the 12th for our chapter meeting in person. Then the very next morning, April 13th, he's going to take us all out to George Mitchell Preserve. Now it's a Thursday morning, but we're going to go to George Mitchell Preserve with Craig and actually use our naturals and do a body of blitz. Okay? So I hope you all can make it. I'm, I'm very sorry. It's in will, will you send us details? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. It, but... Yes. It's going to be. Hey, in the hey Carolyn, can you repeat that? Yes, April, April the 12th is our chapter meeting and Craig is going to drive over and come visit us and it's going to be at six o'clock at night. We'll start our chapter meeting. Craig will do the presentation about iNaturalist again. He'll go into more depth about iNaturalist at that meeting. He won't have to rush. That'll be nice, right, Craig? Yes, correct, correct. And then the very next morning, that Thursday morning, we're going to go to George Mitchell Preserve and do a bio blitz. Yep, it'll Craig. be it, it, yeah, exactly. It'll be a great opportunity to collect data. It will also be a great opportunity to actually practice. The only way you're really going to use iNaturalist if you get out and actually use it, this will be. I, I don't want to say it's a forced thing, but it's the opportunity to really get good at it, to ask questions about. Anything that comes up when I'm there, so that'll be good. And I think I'm going to hope that my new colleague, um, Wendy, will be joining us for that as well. We'll see. We'll see what her schedule allows for. So I'll know that next week. Oh, that's that would be great. Oh yeah. Was, and you had a question. Just asking what time in the morning? In the morning, we're going to start at eight. Right. 
because we're starting to get kind of warmer and we want to make sure we hit, you know, usually the earlier you are in the morning, the more birds there are to see. Right. Birds, especially in George Mitchell Preserve, we've found that, you know, birds have a tendency to kind of disappear from there kind of early. Yeah, yeah, so, yep. it quiets it quiets down pretty good when the heat starts. That's for oh, yeah. sure. Yeah. Do we have any other questions for Craig? He's got a busy day ahead of him. No. Awesome, Craig. Thank you so much for zooming in and joining us and teaching our our class. Thank you, thank you for the opportunity. Hey, when you get a chance, can you send me uh, the breakdown of women versus men so I can put it into my monthly reporting? Absolutely. I know. Perfect. What that's like. I know. <laughs> Okay, guys, I want to introduce you to Justin Bryant. Justin is our um, local um, Texas Parks and Wildlife Department of Wildlife Biologist. You, you've already met um, Diana Ross, who is our advisor for this chapter. Justin, instead of having to come to the very staff, Justin is right there in Huntsville. So he is actually in our area. One of Justin's big projects now is the Huntsville Bat. So if y'all have questions about joining the Bat team or anything after this, please hit him up. He's always looking for new volunteers to help him collect data and to lead that team. Okay. So um, Justin is going to have a uh, Presentation, then we're going to go outside and actually do some investigating. Yes. 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 Okay, Justin, it's all yours. Thank you. So, you got it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, we're good to go. So, like Carolyn said, my name is Tristan Bryant. I am your your local wildlife biologist. I so within the state, we have biologists intertwined into your community. We have typically one to five counties of jurisdiction. My jurisdiction is Walker and Montgomery counties. So I, this is my furthest south boundary. My furthest north boundary is the Trinity River. My job is a private land biologist, otherwise known as a district biologist. So I'm here for the private landowner. Whatever, whenever, however they may need, I'm there for it. My, what I've done ranges everything from helping manage tens of thousands of acres, all the way down to helping a Boy Scout group put in a pollinator garden. So anything in between that, you can call me. I've helped out with private pond work. I've helped out with urban deer work. I've helped out with, you name it, my job is to be a generalist about. So what we're going to do today is kind of a common thing that I get being a biologist, and then I'm sure you get <laughs> maybe even more so more than I do being a master naturalist out in the communities is, hey, you know uh, nature, what's this? Someone hands you a picture, shows you a picture on the phone and say, what is this? And to me, that's kind of a perception that being in natural resources is carried with us is we are Steve Irwin. <laughs> or, you know, we're, we are this, this apex of knowing what is in nature or what this anything in particular may be. And I like this graphic because it kind of shows the different perceptions of what, what it is I do and what it is that naturalists in general do. <laughs> you know, we may think of ourselves as these wildlife warriors like Steve Irwin or out there collaring animals to do migratory studies across continental divides or uh, different uh, con uh, nations, but in all actuality, sometimes it's more computer work than, than not. <laughs> <laughs> but like we said, some common questions we get are, hey, I have this picture I saw in my backyard. What is this? And from my experience, that question can really range from anything from the easy to the difficult. So what I've learned from my years of college is lectures, you learn much, much less than labs. So this is going to be interactive. I'm going to be asking you, and if I don't get volunteers, I'm going to ask specifically. <laughs> so who can tell me what's on the right? Turkey vulture. Turkey vulture. It, yep, absolutely. So kind of the target of what we're going to do is 
looking at taxonomy and more specifically naming and IDing things. So it's always acceptable to go broad and then go specific. So starting with vulture is okay. And then we can narrow it down to what kind of vulture. Who can tell what's on the left? Queen Anne's Lace. Lace, which is one of those that can be a little bit more difficult because it more particularly resembles another plant that is kind of toxic, which is water hemlock. So it's one of those that I can get calls on very frequently, actually. Someone seeing these plants on the side of the road saying, hey, is this hemlock, do they need to get rid of it? And the answer is, well, maybe, but they don't necessarily need to get rid of it. It may be this plant, but, you know, did you get close-up pictures? Did you get the specimen? Like, I can't really get that close of an ID without actually seeing the specimen myself. So, like I said, sometimes these, these pictures, these IDs people ask for, they can be pretty easy, kind of like the example we have on the right, okay? In Texas, we have two different kinds of vultures. We have a turkey vulture on the right and a black vulture on the left, okay? Pretty easily identifiable between two, mainly looking at the secondary feathers, secondary flight feathers being the ones closest to the body, to the bend in the wing, okay? If you know this on the turkey vulture, it's going to be white versus black vultures going to be black. Along with that, the turkey vulture is going to have what's considered a bald head. Now, both of them will not have feathers on their head, but it has a red coloration versus a black coloration. So these could be a pretty easy ID. Most of the time, you don't need binoculars to make this ID. You can do this with your bare eye looking at them in the sky. But if we're looking at the Queen Anne's lace, you really have to get into the nitty gritty to, to find out the difference oh, wow. between the two. <laughs> Typically, the two trademark characters, well, three trademark characteristics is a coloration in hairs along the stem. Wow. In the flowers, in the flowerettes, there's a black dot in the middle for poison hemlock. And the, big, the configuration of the bloom itself can be a little bit more umbrella for hemlock versus a plateau for Queen Anne's lace. But those, that particular ID is variable because this is nature. The moment you say something is, is the moment it proves you wrong. <laughs> so like I said, some of these IDs can be pretty difficult and that's when we get into taxonomy, which is literally splitting hairs. Who knows who this gentleman is on the right? Linnaeus. Carl Linnaeus, correct, known as the father of modern taxonomy. So taxonomy is the, I like to, like to consider it the art of taking something and saying what it exactly is. Now, taxonomy, like all science, is not static, okay? All science is a process, it's very dynamic, it's always changing. So with most scientific names, they'll have a date associated with them, that's the date described. Now, it's very common to have something reclassified into a different scientific, uh, scientific name, typically around genus, sometimes not necessarily species, but if you look at the species, sometimes it can subdivide into more subspecies. So it's literally the art of splitting hairs between different things, okay? So within taxonomy, why is it important to do this. Well, at the end of the day, we could be talking about Queen Anne's lace and poison hemlock, but if we don't, if we're not able to split it out into individual species, then there can be dire consequences. <coughs> or in the instance of instances of particular host plant for caterpillars, we may be targeting certain caterpillars because we didn't split the subspecies apart or split the species apart at genre. So at the end of the day, it may seem like semantics, but these semantics can and do matter on a population scale. And these are what help us further classify things. And they help us be able to understand the world as a naturalist a little bit better. So when we're looking at taxonomy, we kind of have two different worlds. Okay? We have the world of keying and dichotomous keys and we have the world of field guides, okay? So as a field biologist, 
I'll use both depending on the circumstance. And then as a naturalist, I feel as though most of the time you're taught very deeply in the world of field guides. And if anything, you brush over the world of dichotomous keys. By learning and understanding dichotomous keys, you're able to open up your world tremendously and understand things on much finer, much more of a finite scale. So to give you a real-time example, this guy, this is a field guy, okay? It's about the trees of Texas and primarily field guides have pictures and descriptions. They may have a small key at the very beginning, but that's going to be about it. Okay. <laughs> this <laughs> is a murder weapon, <laughs> also known as a dichotomous key. This breaks down the flora of north central Texas into a series of if then statements. So, if a leaf has tooth margins, go A. If not, go B. Kind of like that. It separates it into an easy one, two, if then, this one or this one statements. And going through these statements, it brings you down to an exact species. Now, sometimes these keys require pretty in-depth scientific, or not scientific, laboratory equipment. Okay, sometimes you need a magnifying glass, sometimes you need uh, a microscope, sometimes you need a fine tooth counter to count hairs on things, it just kind of depends on what you're looking at. So what I found really helped, especially in the world of citizen science, are these. These are hybrids, okay? They take, especially this guy, they take a field guide and have general areas, and then they break it into keys, okay? So they'll have a general species, let's say elms, and then you can key elms down from here, whereas that book takes like phylum and breaks it down from phylum. <laughs> so much, much more broad, much, much more specific. This is very similar. This is for the fishes of Texas and freshwater fishers of Texas at that. So these are really helpful, but it's good that this talk comes second because <laughs> I naturalist, and then on that sheet I gave you a moment ago, there are several apps that kind of sit in the place of field guides. So field guides, are kind of becoming a relic in this day and age. AI and apps are taking a lot of field guides place. Personally, I only carry like three field guides in my truck because I can rely on these apps more so than I can a field guide because in my job, sometimes it's more useful to have an instantaneous close key than it is to get a specific key because then I can take that instantaneous close, take a specimen, give general recommendations, go back to my office and then get an exact key with my dichotomous key later. So these apps are fantastic. I like iNaturalist, but as a field biologist, I cycle between three. And that is Seek, Picture This, and iNaturalist. Seek is fantastic because it's instantaneous. Okay, you have your camera open, <laughs> You point it at the specimen and it will key it down to whatever it can go at the lowest time. Now, sometimes that means you have to get different angles of the specimen, but because of that, it helps you understand the parts that go into an ID. Now, picture this is similar. I don't believe it's supported by iNaturalist, but what it is is it <coughs> takes a picture and then the AI scans it and then it typically gives you another ID as well. And then iNaturalist, as Craig, Craig. Craig mentioned, um, is great because it documents that, which adds into our data repository. 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 <laughs> That's something completely different. <laughs> We're not going there. Right. right. But uh, so what that'll do is I'll give us a better data log 
of specimens and IDs. So it's nice to have field IDs and field guides, but these apps are more or less kind of taking their place. So this is kind of the picture I was talking about earlier. The above is a field guide. The bottom is a dichotomous key. Dichotomous keys are not necessarily pretty. They're not necessarily intuitive until you know how to use them. Whereas the field guide is what you'll see in every park store or most bookstores. Field guide you can, or dichotomous keys you kind of have to really look for to get them because most people don't know how to use them and really care to use them in that level five activity. So we're going to do a little game. Okay. <laughs> I gave you some sheets so you have paper. Make me a dichotomous key for these. Now remember, the parts of the dichotomous key are if then statements, meaning, okay, we're going to look at the group and we're going to slowly take one individual out from the whole. Okay, so the first statement will be Is the specimen animated? Yes, you go on to step two. No, you kick one out. Et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So go ahead and make me a key. I want to see what, what y'all can come up with here. And if you need more of an idea of how keys work, the tree identification key I gave you is a simplified dichotomous key. So that's an example you can use as well to get a better idea of how things work. <clears throat> and the good thing about this, so if you were looking at true dichotomous keys, okay, you're keying out between two different numbers. It's not very subtle. These are traits that will not usually change. If they do, it's over generations through natural selection. This is much more whimsical. There are a million and one different things between each of these things. It's up for you to choose one. So if I were looking at it, I could do one initial breakdown of saying bipedal worker versus quadruped. And that would give me two different groups. I would have the bighorn sheep, the cricket, and Mickey and Minnie Mouse. Bighorn sheep, cricket here, Mickey and Minnie Mouse over here. I could do using clothing. I could do animate. <laughs> I could use Disney, not Disney. Antenna, not antenna. Antenna, not antenna. Horn, yeah. spot horn. Mammal, insect. You can't really tell whether or not you can use that. You know, you can use But if you're, if you're brand new to it and you see that picture, you really don't see fur, right? So give me some, some ideas of how you can separate these groups that we haven't mentioned so far. Invert, non-invert. Anything else? What's that? This is real or animated. Yeah, real animated. You do male, female. Yeah, rodent, mouse, not. Tail, no tails. Tails, no tails. Yeah, exactly. So this is a quick and dirty example of how dichotomous keys work. Okay. So now I want you to try to do this. This is a real breakdown that I'm going to show you after. I tried, I tried getting them far enough apart that it's pretty easy to distinguish, but I tried to also make them close enough together where you have to think a little bit about this. Now, a couple of caveats. Within the true phylogenetic tree of these individuals, where they break apart, we get into some dentation, we get into cranial structures, we get into ear bone structures. 
You don't have to do that. You can do purely morphometric traits. You can do behavioral traits. Just for the sake of making your gears turn, making you not like this talk a little bit more. <laughs> so what throw out some things how we could separate them. Aquatic, non-aquatic, yeah. Four legged prefers. Yeah, you could do four legged saying walks on four legs. I don't know about saying four yeah. appendages. What's wow. another? What's the tail? Tail, striped tail, yeah. You could do what's that? Carnivorous omnivores. Yeah, that's a good one. They're all in mammalia, so they all have fur. Wild, yes. Well, they're all technically wild animals. Marsupial. Marsupial is one of the real breakers. Now, marsupial is not necessarily a point of division so you're thinking about phylogenetic tree you're thinking about a common ancestor okay saying marsupial is not necessarily the common ancestor but for the fake sake of this demonstration that's acceptable so if we're thinking okay they're actually in order of the phylogenetic tree of when they broke apart okay so first one to break off is marsupials over on the left. Next, it breaks down to carnivora, which was everything after that. From carnivora, okay, you're going to have your first break. So up here above the little coyote, we'll have our mountain lion, which is felidae, okay, purely carnivorous. But how do you know from the image that it's much because that is a North American possum. <laughs> <laughs> and that's our no, only known so North American possum. Trying to ID something in the field. You wouldn't know. You wouldn't, you wouldn't know. know. So this is purely to help you understand how things break apart okay. and where you draw the dividing lines. Okay. Now, in the field, that's not necessarily what you'll do, but that's when you use a combination of field guide knowledge with dichotomous key taxonomic knowledge. Okay, so to, to help you better understand a field guide, the, the secret is in the name. You use it in the field. A dichotomous key and breaking things down taxonomically, you, dare, you do that in the lab. So you take a specimen back, you take pictures back to the lab, and then you analyze it in the lab. If I'm breaking down an unknown species of tree or insect in the lab, that could take out depending on how comfortable I am with the species, how comfortable I am with the terminology, and then going down through the key. And typically, whenever I'm working through like that key, I usually allow for four or five mistakes. Because I'll get down to an ID, and I'll read the description, I'm like, that can't be there. There's <laughs> so much wrong here. So one of my it or if then statements was incorrect. So I back it back out to the last one I know for sure was correct. And that's the thing about science. We're always going to be wrong. It's just a matter of how <laughs> frequent and if we're willing to admit that. <laughs> so it kind of breaks down. You have marsupials first, then your carnivora. Your felidae comes out of carnivora. Then your, uh, this one, I had some conflicting information I found online. The bottom right can kind of flip one way or the other. If your Procarionidae comes out first, which are your raccoons, or if your Otaridae comes out first, which is your seals and sea lions. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, they basically break out similarly. And you can say marsupial, purely carnivorous, then these other two are omnivorous, and you could the breaking point can be semi aquatic. So, to give you a little background now, what we're going to do is we're going to try to go have a little hike and do some keying, okay? So the main learning curve or threshold of entry here is knowing the terminology. And the terminology for plant ID, to me, and I'm not a plant person, is the hardest part. <laughs> 
Okay. Plant people make a million and one names for the same thing. <laughs> and they have a million and one different attributes they look at. So the important thing here to understand our leaf shape, which is on the left, okay? Typically you look at lobes, which are wherever a leaf is sitting there, wherever it has an indentation into the margin, okay? You look at the margin, which is the edges of the leaf. You look at arrangement, which is where the leaf comes off of the stem and how that is. Then you look at the base of the leaf. So that's where the leaf, the actual fleshy part comes into the stem of the leaf and then the tip of the leaf, okay? That's, going, that's the, the easy and quick of it. And all the specimens I flagged can be broken down based on those terms, okay? So what we're going to do is I have four keys printed out from my murder weapon. <laughs> and I need groups of four, and then you're going to help break these plants down and give me an idea. Okay? How many groups is for the four tables? Perfect. Perfect. Already set up. Look at that. Four. All right, y'all ready? Y'all think y'all can do it? <laughs> um, I have these here. I also have a glossary of terms here, too, in case you need some further definition. So once you get your groups, have one person in your groups come to me, and I will give you your weapons. All right. Glossary. This is the main thing. That's for demonstration. That's not the This is your own key. All right. Who's next? Glossary. Are you ready? Yeah. He's gonna get it for me. Same thing. Glossary. This is just for primary. So I'll come out and lead y'all to my flags. <laughs> and last one. I know. We need to bring that up as we go. I don't think so. I think we just need to have you just get okay. And what we can do is if you have any of those apps, we can take pictures and see how close they are. Picture this, and I know. Yes, that's right. At least it's not going to be a tree. Okay, good. Okay, guys. Yeah. We have lots of questions about how to get in touch with Trust about the back project. I'm going to let him tell you a little bit more about that. Here is his contact info Trust and Brian. If y'all want to snap a picture, that's how you get in touch with Trust and Trust and tell them about how they can get involved with the back project. Yes, so the best way is email. I'm currently a little bit in the backlog of uh, emails and voicemails from being out last week, but that phone number goes to my office. So if you call that phone number, I'm sorry, but I don't check it every day. I don't go into my office every day, but I do check my email every day so I can get back to you much faster than uh, the process with the bat stuff. Like I said earlier, you're going to email me. We'll set up a time. We'll talk. I'll give you some handouts and some information. And I'll give you a general script. I'll invite you to our calendar where we have our individual bat chat dates and let you fly from there. It's basically just a process of making sure that you know the situation around the facility and around what's happening with the colony. And then to help you understand how the chats are set up and then to give you a little bit of information. But the key here is I want you to look up the bulk of what you say so that way you make it your own. 
If I tell you what to say, it's going to be robotic. It's not going to seem genuine. I want you to make the talk your own talk. Okay. So we'll give you the parameters of what to say and how to say it, but specifically what you say, what backpacks you use, anything like that, hopefully that'll be some of your own fruition. Beyond that, um, for the bat chats, what we do for them is they are held on every Friday night. We typically ask folks to get there 30 minutes before sunset to facilitate conversations with, with people. You're not required to be there every Friday. My goal is to have enough volunteers to where you only need to personally go once a month and they're in groups of two. So you and one other person go and do the chat each Friday night. Additionally, part of what we're doing with this group is we're learning about the colony, taking data from it. So with that, the chat is two parts. One person will be leading the talk, controlling the crowd. The other person will be there to bounce ideas off of and gather the data we need for the colony specifically. The other thing is on Monday nights, I ask one person to go up and to gather that data aside from the chat. So there are no chats on Monday nights, strictly data collection. Now, anything beyond that, completely up to you. I'll take all the data you can give me. If you want to go every other night, you're more than welcome to. And if you want to go in the morning before dawn to see the bats come back, you're more than welcome to. I'll take any and all data. But the data, they can do it as an intern, but to lead a bat chat, they need to be graduates. <laughs> and I think that's going to work out pretty smoothly because that gives you from now till June, if you want to join, to watch some of those folks that may have chat, did the chat at wall and done a chat here to see how they do it, how they operate. So it's more of a mentorship if you want for that. What time do you want to play? Yeah. The chats are going to start a half hour before sunset. So because sunset changes, it's going to be variable. Like sunset now is 7.45, 8-ish. Sunset in September is going to be close to 9. So it'll change throughout. The and so um, like, wherever they meet, just at the colony there? So wherever you meet, there's two options for parking. One is at like the City Hall Cafe, kind of adjacent to it. The other is on the north end that was demolished. The bat chats are held on the south east corner in the little parking lot that's TDCJ uh, property in front of a building, okay? But if you do decide to help out, decide to join, we can go over all those details. I can show you the data sheet, what to take, how to take it, where to show up and all of that, where we do that. So that way there's no extra confusion because I know if. If you're anything like me, and I tell you now, I would forget it because I'm not writing it down or I'm not putting it in my calendar. So um, that'll help kind of streamline stuff. Is there a bunch of people interested in doing that? Are, are y'all near Huntsville? No. Hmm. That's okay. That's okay. I live in Willis, so I'm technically near, technically not. So <laughs> definitely so, yeah. Some of y'all are down here close to where we are now. So, but you're more than welcome to help out as much or as little as you want. Yes, ma'am. So the bat chats, they're just on the colony in Huntsville, correct? Okay. Now, Diana does have a separate bat chat group for the Wall Bridge in Houston, and she has the information for that. So if you're interested in that one, you can contact her. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, Diana's contact should be up there as well. Yeah. Yeah, there she is. Um, beyond that, I also, I have stuff coming up soon that I may need volunteers. So if you just want to volunteer in general, let me know. I have surveys. I have dove surveys coming up and then doing some site visits. And I might start a project personally where I do more plant cataloging. So it'd be similar to like what we're doing here, where I'm getting specific plants, pressing them for specimens to give to landowners for representation of what they need and don't need. So plenty of stuff coming up if y'all are interested. Make sure you keep us in the yeah. loop so we can put it in the bulletin. Yeah.
and we'll take the steps that we get do. even more volunteers. Yeah. Thank you so much, Pastor. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Hope you learned something. If you didn't, oh, yeah. it's okay. Right. Yeah. It was, uh, it's always good when you get outside, right? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and see those big caterpillars. Wasn't that awesome? That was, yeah. that was the best. Okay. So, so your walking orders, your homework is to make sure you have iNaturalist downloaded to your phone. Make sure you start using it. Do not forget that Craig will be here on the 12th at night to teach us more specifics about iNaturalist. And then to leave more on the 13th for you. Then the City Nature Challenge, let me tell you, it is fabulous to be involved with. I used to go out and take a ton of pictures and load them immediately, and I'd be like number seven in the whole Houston area, right? I'd be like, oh, this is really cool. I got all these little things in here. You know, you know what happens? Those people are holding their observations to Sunday and then putting them in the last minute. I was down to 42 by the time. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, it's very exciting to get in and, and actually know that what you're doing is not just a little competition of fun, but that it's going to help you to make decisions. So thank you so much for coming. I will see you next week, next Saturday at Jones Forest. Okay? Oh, and don't forget, we're having a picnic at Jones Forest. Did I tell y'all about that? No. Oh my God. I don't know. I don't know. Okay, so, so next week, on April 1st, we're going to get together and Donna Work is going to tell us all about forest ecosystems. She's going to tell us about the red cockaded woodpecker and about um, Jones Forest efforts to decrease its population. She's going to take us for a walk in the forest to see if we can see red cockaded woodpeckers. And then when we get back to the class, we're going to picnic lunches. We're going to sit out under the trees. We're going to have a little picnic lunch, and then we've invited the entire chapter to come. There's a little creek that runs through the back end of the forest on the north side that has old tires in it. It gets debris from this neighborhood that's right to the north of it. Yeah. So we're going to do it like a little litter sleep. If y'all have litter browsers for them, if you want to wear some boots, you can get down there quick. Do. If you want to just sit on the side and say, there's a tire. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, there's somebody's place that yeah, you, you can do that too. So it, it's it's social time, it's volunteer time. So please. And that's on after that's, our meeting. That's yes. On, on April, April 1st. 1st. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we'll have a lunch and then take a walk. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Bring plenty of water, gloves, whatever. Oh, Tim, today's Mercer's Pike sale. Oh, yes. Yes. Today's Mercer's Pike sale. Yes. And they're actually. It's not going. Yes. Yeah. It's there yesterday. So. And they're they're also having a um, the Lone Star. Um. Native plants of it, Lone Star Nursery on Lone Star Parkway in um, Oh yeah. Well, no, there's they're open today, yesterday and today. But what time do they start to sell nursery? They're open till two. I'm gonna get up there right now. And then the Pines and Prairies Native Plant Society yeah. chapter has their plant sale, the 14th and 15th. The Friday evening uh, for members, and you can join that day if you're not already a member. And then Saturday from nine to one, I think. We have a ton of locally sourced, um, propagated um, plants that just an amazing variety of things that you can't buy. Okay. You just can't buy.